art galleries. They are currently online, so you can see them. Uh, we have, besides uh, Art Embraces Words, we have nine other active programs that we that we provide for our community. And those could include some that you might have heard from, heard of, La Miranda Idol, um, the high school visual arts competition, which is extremely popular with our high school students. And that just culminated in March. And you can see all of their work on our website as well. And we have new programs, Artify Arinda, which is a fabulous program. We are beautifying the outside, the all of Arinda. And we even have one of our artists here today who contributed to that effort. We also have a very fun Super Shorts, which is a three minute movie challenge for all ages from as young as, I don't know, nursery all the way up to adulthood. So we got lots of opportunities for our community members to showcase their talents and participate in the La Miranda Arts Council programs. So please do check out all of these on our website, lamarindaarts.org and uh, let us know if you're interested in participating or getting involved. I do wanna let you know that Art Embrace Works will be coming to you on several more occasions here uh, in the virtual format and possibly in person. We will see how things work out. Um, and so please stay in touch and check our website frequently. To give you a little bit of a background of Art Embraces Words, uh, you might be wondering how did, how did this come to be that we put together artists as well as writers? Well, it is the brainchild of Elena Olaski, who is a board member, and she teamed up with Natalie Wheeler, also another board member, member to create this program. Initially, they found that there were just no outlets for writers to present their work to a live audience. There were plenty of classes and like clubs and things like that, and they could share, share their work there, but this, they did not have a venue to actually read their work out loud to an audience. And also in terms of our artists in the community, they're always looking for ways to show their artwork and to exhibit. So it all kind of came together when Elena was attending an art exhibit. She was so mesmerized by a few of the paintings there they almost had to kick her out because she just wouldn't leave. And what she wanted was to contain that feeling and that excitement um, in a venue that merged both writing and art. And the way she put it is um, that same creative juice that flows from original art is exactly what I wanted emerging writers to feel surrounded by when they read their work in public and often when they're reading for the first time. And thus, Art Embraces Words was born. Um, before the pandemic, we held the event in the Lafayette Library in their um, art and sciences room. We had a live audience. We had the, uh, the writers presenting at the front and surrounding everyone was beautiful artwork, photography, lots of different things. It was a magical feeling and it was one that we hoped we could, you know, keep doing on a regular basis, uh, four to six times a year, and then the pandemic. And luckily, um, our team turned everything around and we were able to bring you this virtual format. So we hope it's just as magical as it was in person. Now, um, they did come up with a lovely, uh, tagline if you, if you have if you will and it goes like this writers paint images with words and artists tell stories with color and together they enrich our community and that is how art embraces words came to be so now I would like to mention that we are all on zoom here we're all reliant on our as I just saw on my screen you have unstable internet Wonderful. So let's hope that we go through the program with no glitches and please do forgive us if we do have any issues. I would also like to direct you, if you can take your cursor and go to the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q and A box there. And that is where you can write questions while the presenters are talking. 
um, go ahead and write your questions in there and I'll do my best to address them once they're done speaking and they can answer them. And of course, we love words of encouragement and anything you'd like to say there, um, we would love to be able to hear from you. Now, our theme today is love and redemption, and you will see this woven throughout the program. But first, I'd like to introduce to you everyone who is here today who will be presenting. On our show, Barbara Nelson, Lucy Beck, Bill Carmel, Mary Lou Correa, and Michael Barrington. All right, well, let's begin. I'd like to start with our first writer, Barbara Nelson of Lafayette. Barbara was a therapist for many years, including on a psych ward for four years and as a school social worker with very challenged kids. She, she then got involved with refugees, starting many programs, including an LGBTQ refugee program for people from Iran, Iraq, and Africa. Um, plus, she was directing a refugee and immigrant program for the Jewish Family and Community Services of East Bay for over 20 years, working with people again from all over the world. She has enjoyed writing since she was a teenager. A teenager, she did a lot of work uh, writing, a lot of writing at work, but didn't start writing creatively until retirement. She explored memoir, creative nonfiction essays, and is now writing a young adult novel. Today, she will be reading from her piece, Sis and Marty, A Love Story, a creative nonfiction tale based on the story of how your parents met. Welcome, Barbara. So nice to have you here today. I'm gonna to read a story called Sis and Marty, A Love Story that's based on the story of my parents. Sis and Marty, A Love Story. Estelle Shapira, called Sis by everyone she knew, was by all accounts, a good Jewish girl. Her older sister, Ruth, was the rebel of the family but Sis worked hard to please her parents, keeping to herself any problems that might cause them worry. Once, when she was 10, she fell off her bike on her way home from school and cut her knee badly. She limped home and slipped quietly into the family's large red brick house, making her way up the back stairs to the bathroom so she could take care of it before her mother found out. It was a deep enough cut that eventually she had to go to the doctor and have stitches, but she was more distressed about the possibility of upsetting her parents than by the event itself. Her parents were not punitive, but Sis knew they'd had a hard life as, a, as young immigrants and she wanted to do all in her power to make them happy. Sis was the second of five siblings, four girls and a boy. Her parents had emigrated from Poland and Austria to the Lower East Side of Manhattan in the early 1900s, and all of their children were born in the United States. During Sis's childhood, her father was a successful furrier in a business he shared with his brother while her mother was a housewife. They lived in a big house in Lawrence, Long Island, an affluent suburb. They had a large extended family with so many cousins that when there were weddings, only the oldest sibling in each family was invited. Known as pretty and popular, Sis was also a very good student. She dated a number of different boys, but never had a serious boyfriend. When Sis graduated from high school, she and Ruth, who was her best friend as well as her sister, both went to college at NYU while living at home, commuting to classes on the Long Island Railroad and the subway. Sis had wanted very much to go away to college, but it was the depression, and her father said that she would go over his dead body. He didn't mean it literally, but he was ashamed that he had recently lost almost all his money, and he didn't want to send her to school when he couldn't afford it. After two years at NYU, Sis was accepted to the University of Michigan. She had worked in a clothing store to save some money. And on a cold January day in 1937, she boarded a train to the Midwest 
to start the winter term. Her mother saw her off at the station, but her father was angry that she had defied him and refused to come. She was sorry that he was so mad, but she felt she had to pursue her dream of going away to college. She trusted he would forgive her in time. Her father had always had a temper, but his anger didn't last long. At NYU, Sis had been casually dating a young man named Charlie Goldstein. Charlie's good friend, Marty Sukney was a student at U of M a year ahead of her. Charlie told Marty to take good care of Sis and Marty met her at the train station when she arrived in Ann Arbor. Over the next few weeks with Marty's help, she found a small affordable attic room to rent a couple of miles from campus and a part-time job in a science lab taking care of the rats. Marty had grown up in Far Rockaway, one town over from Sis's home on Long Island, but she had never met him. He was strikingly good looking with warm brown eyes that made her feel like she was the only person in the room. Marty had started in Michigan as a freshman. He swam breaststroke and for the varsity swim team and belonged to a Jewish fraternity. He wore a top hat to dances and had an old car to get around in the snowy winter. Sis could not afford to join a sorority or live closer to campus. When she was low on funds, she ate the cereal meant for the rats in the lab. Every month, her mother sent her a chicken, which took days to arrive from New York. She wondered whether it was safe to eat, but always ate it anyway, loving the taste of home. A couple of times a week, Marty helped her with rides home from campus at night. He began inviting her to parties on the weekends and pretty soon they were dating. Sis was smitten. She had never felt this way about anyone before. When they both came home from this, for the summer, Sis told her family about Marty. I met this great guy. He comes from Far Rockaway, she said to her parents. I think you'll really like him. What's his name, asked her mother. Marty Sukney, she replied. Her parents were silent. What's the problem, asked Sis, worry creeping into her voice. We know that family, said her mother, shaking her head sadly. Marty's father's first wife was Jenny, a cousin of your Aunt Emma, my brother Henry's wife. He and Jenny had two children, and then she died young from cancer. Everyone said it was because her husband was so mean to her. He's been married at least two more times since then. Sissy, they are not a good family. I don't want you to go out with Marty and he's certainly not someone to get serious about. Tears welled in Sissy's eyes, but he's so nice. He's the most wonderful man I've ever met. She paused and then continued. Well, anyway, I'm going to Vermont to work as a camp counselor soon. If you insist, I'll tell him we have to break it off. He's hinted that he had a complicated family, but he's never said anything bad about them. And I think he's really nice, no matter what you think of his father. When she met Marty at the local coffee shop, Sis told him that her parents didn't want her to see him anymore. He told her that he hadn't wanted to share the full story of his family with her, and that he hadn't known that his father's first wife was related to Sis's mother's family. I'm the youngest of six children, he explained, and the only one related to all of them. There were three from my mother and two from my father, all from previous marriages. Then my parents had me. When I was eight, my parents divorced and my father married the housekeeper. I never saw my mother after that. And my stepmother told me I was so bad, even my own mother didn't want to see me. How awful, said Sis, putting her hand on his arm. Did you ever see your mother again? Marty sighed and went on. My mother showed up at my high school graduation. I didn't even recognize her at first. She told me my father and his wife hadn't allowed her to see me in all those years. Now I visit her when I'm in New York. I see my father and my stepmother too. There's no point in being bitter and angry. 
Sis marveled that Marty could forgive the parents who had betrayed him so deeply. It just made her appreciate him more. She went to Vermont for the summer and Marty stayed to work with his older half brothers in their textile business in the city. They agreed to stop dating. Sis wasn't willing to go against her parents' wishes in order to be with him, even though she liked him a lot. After the summer, Sis and Marty both returned to school in Michigan. Marty needed an extra semester to finish and Sis was in her last year. She fully intended to move on and try to meet other men. She went out with a student that she knew from the lab, but her heart wasn't in it. One night, Sis and a friend were at the Pretzel Bell, a popular Ann Arbor restaurant near campus, when she ran into Marty and a group of his friends. She had almost forgotten how attractive he was and how kind. He seemed as happy to see her as she felt to see him. Can I call you, he asked. Michigan seemed like a world away from her parents' house on Long Island. Of course, she answered, pushing away thoughts about her mother's admonition about Marty's family. Soon they were going out together often. Their feelings for each other grew quickly. What are we going to do, Sis asked him after a wonderful evening of dinner and, da and dancing. I want to marry you, Estelle, he said to her. If you feel the same way about me, we have to tell your parents and hope that they'll change their mind. They both went to see their families during the winter holidays. Sis approached her mother first. I want you to give Marty another chance, she said to her mother. Please, I love him, truly love him. I know he's the one for me. He isn't like you described his father. He's a wonderful, kind, intelligent man. After listening to her talk about Marty, Sis's parents agreed to meet him. On the day that he was to come to the house, she was very nervous. She hadn't mentioned the idea of marriage to her parents and, she, and wasn't sure if he would bring it up. Marty arrived early. He brought her mother white roses and her father cigars. They all sat in the parlor together. After some small talk about Michigan and Marty's studies, Marty addressed Sis's father. I'm in love with your daughter, sir, he said and she's in love with me. I want to marry her. I know that you have concerns about my family, but I promise I will always be good to her and treat her well. Will you give me a chance? We can wait until after we graduate so that you can have time to get to know me. Sis's father sighed. He looked at his daughter who met his gaze with pleading eyes. Sis could tell that Marty had already won her mother's approval. Her father turned back to Marty. I have four daughters. You plucked the rose, he said, nodding his head towards Sis. See that you deserve her. And I just uh, want to share with you two photos. This is one from their wedding uh, with an uncle. Okay. That's that. And um, this is one about 30 years later. Wow, that's lovely. And truly they were a couple who always stayed in love. Right. Just very glamorous in that photo. <laughs> Wonderful story. Wonderful story. Okay, um, a few questions for you, uh, Barbara. So who told you about your mother and father's courting and getting married? Was it your was it your mom or was I would it say it was else? mostly my mom and my grandmother that uh, and they told you and and all of the detail and yeah I would say that all the details I included were true or certainly were family lore um, the part about my father's family was something that I pursued because it was so confusing and so complicated and I could never figure out how his father was related to my mother's family. So I was, I asked a lot of questions about it to everybody, him and my mother and my grandparents. Mm -hmm. And um, have you read this to anyone else in your family? Um, I've shared it with my children. 
Oh, you have. Oh, mm -hmm. that's good. That's fun. And will it be, um, is this memoir part of a series about your family or will it be a standalone nonfiction memoir? Well, it's kind of a standalone, but I also was writing different stories about um, all my mother's siblings and their families. So I was thinking about um, doing a book where um, different people kind of avert emerged as the main character of a section. Um, oh, I see. Okay. And uh, are you, you hard at work on it? Is it like coming to completion or will we get to hear the rest of the story soon? <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> I can't, I can't predict how Okay. <laughs> okay. Very all right, good. Well, we have a few comments from our Q&A. Uh, first of all, it only says YZ, so I don't know. Maybe you know who YZ is, but it says, we love you, Barbara. <laughs> and Samantha Samlet says, bravo. And Sherry Vogel says, great story, Barb. So you have a fan club out there starting. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. <laughs> so thank you for listening, everybody. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and we look forward to hearing what happens next with your family memoir. It's wonderful. All right. Um, I apologize to everyone if I'm having some uh, Wi-Fi issues um, and hopefully we can figure those out soon. I wanna move on to our uh, first artist who is photographer Lucy Beck of Lafayette. She is um, drawn to photograph the fleeting beauty of botanicals and is especially captivated by the beauty of flor flowers. You can view Lucy Beck's work at the Moraga Art Gallery. So Lucy, I hope you'll elaborate a little bit more and tell us about yourself and uh, also show us some of your beautiful work. Lucy, take it away. <laughs> I'm um, quite nearsighted, not as nearsighted as I used to be before I had cataract surgery, but I used to get very close <laughs> to flowers way before I had a camera and, and uh, just appreciate the incredible beauty. I think I'm drawn to beauty just in a, in a very basic way. And I think beauty is something that uh, the, our, our world is, our world needs beauty. I think we all need beauty. And if you look at the structure of, of natural things, generally there's beauty there. So that's, I think that's been kind of my driving uh, motivation for photography. And what I do is create something. I'm not generally going out and in, into uh, in doing landscape photography, but creating something. So I start with a blank palette, uh, essentially. What my my uh, blank palette in most of my photography that you'll, in all of it that you'll see here, no, not all of it, but in two of them is a mm -hmm. light box. Um, and the one we're gonna start with, I believe is I have a black, uh, it's actually used velvet that I hung up and I arranged the flowers. And it's a lot about the arrangement of what, how can I create something beautiful? The flowers uh, honestly tell me what to do. They will lean in certain ways. They'll lean towards each other, or away from, e from each other. And so I, I watch that and I try to respect what they're telling me to do. I wow. do uh, adjust things uh, and you'll see some of my arrangements aren't possible in real life. I think what I do is it's a, it's a creative process, but you know, it's part photography, it's part imagination, a large part imagination, and it's part digital painting, although I'm not adding anything generally, but uh, revealing things. I see. Can uh, we go ahead and, and start to look at some of your pieces and then you can elaborate more? Okay. So in this one, you're seeing an arrangement of beautiful calla lilies. I got these flowers from uh, Diablo Foods. <laughs> I, they usually have an amazing flower uh, 
choice. There are lots, lots of possibilities. Uh, so I loved the colors, the color combination, the contrasting colors of the pinks and the yellows and the greens. And so I, I arranged them in a way that I felt uh, created some movement. Uh, I love the green leaf coming. It's actually part of a flower coming out, but it's, it's a, to me, I'm, I'm, I'm searching for something that is beautiful and trying to arrange it in a way that's beautiful. So my process is not, I, I don't do a single shot. I'm, I do multiple shots at different exposures. I, this may not make sense at all, but in Photoshop, I will choose a little bit from each exposure. In this case, I start with a very, very uh, underexposed picture. So I get a nice black background. And then little by little, I will choose, uh, maybe I'll do seven to nine photos at different exposures and I'll choose a little bit from each exposure to bring more light into the picture in this case. Um, so that's that's kind of the process in a, in a, a little nutshell, kind of an egg one. Uh, let's see, any, I don't, I think that's, yeah, I mean, that's, it, it's, you know, I, I can do a workshop on this. It would take three days, but it, it's uh, maybe that's enough for right now about what this yeah, picture that, That's very interesting. I mean, you know, dig, it's all about digital now and to be able to manipulate so much and so well, your actual photos online is fascinating. Yeah, it's fascinating the process. So th this one, I, I just loved the, uh, the liveliness of, the, of these combinations. And what I look for often is contrasting colors and contrasting movements. But to this, this one felt so much like a dance. I mean, I've actually labeled it more than one way, let's dance or at the dance or dance with me or <laughs> uh, because it has, it has a feeling to me uh, of dancing and they have Flowers have personalities to me, and and uh, this this one's very lively, uh, and, and I just I can I feel like I get to know them as I'm playing around arranging them. This one is done in the reverse way of the of the one you saw on black. I start with very very overexposed to create a white a very bright kind of white background to start with. If you look at the uh, sweet peas at the top, you can see that they're uh, partly, they look partly translucent. And that's because that was way overexposed. Uh, you'll see that there's another uh, texture there that looks like rice paper. It is rice paper. I had photographed rice paper and then using a, a tool in Photoshop, I was able to put that rice paper in as part of the picture I did you do that in the last step actually and uh, mm -hmm. that gives it another dimension so they feel mm -hmm. they feel like they're standing up but actually this is photographed this one was photographed on the on the floor with a light box mm -hmm. um, above it at 90 degrees I mean uh, directly above it I mean the camera right. directly above it and it was photographed backlit with a light with mm -hmm. a on a light box. So yeah, yeah they, it's, a, it's a fun, it, it very, feels like a very creative process. And I will go to various places to find flowers, sometimes from my garden, sometimes from uh, other people's gardens. I don't go steal them, but, um, or walking right. along a street, I might cut off a few uh, flowers, um, just, uh, you know, I've, I've picked some poppies from Bard and things like that. But, you know, you find them where you can. And, and I buy a lot from different places, too. Okay. And I think the next one was uh, one of your award-winning pieces. Is that the That's right. One? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they've all won awards. But this one I submitted to the uh, Triton museum in Santa Clara and it won second place, which honest to God, I was astounded by that because, you know, when you submit something to a competition, you don't really expect to win anything. 
And um, so, yes, I, I understand there I, were 800 submissions. Yeah, more than 800 submissions. More yeah. than 800 submissions. And I did not know I had won. I went down to, well, I knew they, I got an email saying that your your picture has placed. And so I, I went down to the museum and there it was uh, in a fe very featured spot and, and I saw it at one second place. It, you know, it was, oh my God, I couldn't believe it. So that picture is, picture I've printed quite large. Um, I think this one, oh, it has it, has it 36 and a half by 30 and a half. And, and it, it looks good big. It's a lisianthus blossom. And you don't generally see, they sort of generally hang down kind of like that. You don't see the uh, very vibrant centers. Uh, they're not always, mm -hmm. if you look at, if you open them up, they're not always that beautiful, uh, vibrant green like this one is, but every flower is different. And this one, it was just remarkably beautiful. It is gorgeous, just gorgeous. Great, oh, okay, so, well, yeah, go ahead. I wanted you to say, I print on different kinds of paper. Things can, uh, my pictures can be printed on anything pretty much, but um, this one I have printed on rice paper. I'm going to see if I can show you. This is a different picture, but if if you can see that, what can you see the grain in the paper at all? Yeah, if you the hold back. real still, if you hold it real still for just a second, you can semi see the the grain. Maybe describe it a little bit. It's actually not grain, but but it's fibers and. And this is um, mulberry paper. Um, it's, I think maybe, yeah, you can see it actually better if it's back a little bit, I think. But it it's- It does look like a painting. It looks yeah, like- Yeah, this is another picture that um, I did yesterday. It's, um, yeah, they can look like paintings. Um, the processing I do um, hel helps with that. I, I mean, I definitely it helps with that. They, most of them look quite painterly, I think. Yeah. And I see that you are sitting there, and I believe it's at the Moraga Art Gallery. I just want to let all our viewers know that Moraga does have a wonderful art space that is yes. actually fairly new, I believe, um, in the Green Shopping Center. And so you're manning the, the front desk there, which is That's fabulous. Right. Well, I, so. I just um, came over to sit in front of my, my pictures, but we have a beautiful more than 3,000 square foot space. And I encourage everyone to come visit. We have a lot of wonderful art here. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that the gallery has helped you stay in touch with other artists during the pandemic. Well, to a point, we actually closed for a, quite a while because, because of the pandemic. Right. We did have regular Zoom meetings where, <laughs> surprise, mm -hmm. surprise, where we would talk about when we could open, how much we could open. And of course, us artists still kept making things. You just can't help it. Um, mm -hmm. But I, we are now open, at this point, we're open two days a, a week, and we hope okay. to increase that really soon. Great. Well, Lucy, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I, I want to mention that, of course, your work is for sale, for sale at the gallery. Also, she has a website. It is Lucy. See Beck Photography, and that's Beck, B-E-C-K, photography.com, Lucy Beck. Very good. Well, thank you again for being with us. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Next, we have a uh, writer, both writer and artist, Bill Carmel of San Ramon. Um, Bill has 45 plus years experience as a professional artist. And his fine art paintings, sculptures, and designs are included in private, corporate, and public art collections in North America, Europe, and Australia. He completed his MFA at UC Berkeley, and after teaching at Humboldt State University and Southern Illinois University, he returned to the Bay Area where he remains active in the arts by serving as the co-curator of the La Miranda Arts Council's Fine Art Gallery and Art Embraces Words, and also Artify Arinda 
and by exhibiting throughout the Bay Area. Bill reviews exhibits at SF MoMA, the San Francisco Fine Arts Museums and other Bay Area exhibition venues. Um, he is currently developing a fine arts public school curriculum centered in creative strategies that utilize STEM and humanities topics to teach art and art topics to teach STEM and well, yeah, that's what I just said, to teach STEM and humanities. So he's quite involved with the local school curriculum. And I wanna hopefully see Bill here on the screen, Natalie. And Bill will be reading from his art space blog article. He does do a blog um, on uh, Dan DanvilleSamRamon.com. And he'll be reading from that, the ballad from Andy and Rocky and show his Artifier Render mural that illustrates the moment of redemption in the story. Bill, are you there? Hi, everybody. There you are. Okay, I didn't see you there for a minute. So, the introduction. great, Bill. Well, welcome, and I can't wait to hear your blog. This story memorializes the recent mural for La Mirinda Arts Council, Artify Arinda, and uh, it's one of the few times that stories originate at the same time that paintings do. But this, this one just happened that way. And I painted the mural and then finished the story uh, a few months later and then published it in the blog. So I'll begin reading. This is the story of two brave little animals, Andy the Hummer and Rocky the Squirrel both struggling to survive amid the human suburban settlements. In, this, in the temperate chaparral of the San Francisco Bay Area, wild animals cling to life by their wits and good fortune. Some live in harmony with plants and other animals, the pollinators, while others, the ravagers, take things. The pollinators understand that they are made to nurture, to protect, and to care for their kind. Cultivated by humans, gardens in the area provide flowers, herbs, fruits, and vegetables all year round. Enough for all when the animals take only what they need. These gardens include the flower of the Mondara didmia, a native North American plant of the mint family with the mythic properties of nurturing by healing emotional wounds. It attracts the love and devotion of all who see it and drink tea made from it. Ballad of Andy and Rocky. An immense feeling welled up inside Andy the Hummer at the first sight of her, perched atop a magnificent pineapple sage. He flew up to her and couldn't be believe that she became more beautiful the closer he flew. Hovering just above, bobbing back and forth, he sang at the top of his voice over and over until she nodded to him. She chirped her name, Anna. Then he raced high, tore a hole in the sky. No need to look back to see that she watched. When it seemed wings could push air no longer, he lunged back down. And just before reaching her perch, he stopped, whipping his tail with a fierce crack that she pretended not to shock her. But not for long, she flew off onto the nearby quince tree where she would nest and raise her brood. Andy watched from a place just above and sang to her from time to time. He warned off the other male hummers that wanted the garden's sweet nectar. He protected his little piece of paradise. Paradise for a hummer is finding a garden with year-round nectar-rich flowers and humans to tend the garden. Andy grows, Andy's garden grows his favorites, Mandara didmia or bee balm, as well as salvia elegans, penstemon, verbena, lavender, cosmos, and yarrow. Pollinators sing to the plants and rejoice in the seeds that renew the garden. The generations thrive. Anna took a week to build her nest. A few days later, she filled it with two precious eggs. Andy recalled the legends handed down to him from the beginning of, beginning of time about the invasions, plunder, terror, 
and death that ravagers impose. There seem to be no limit to what they take. When there is something they can eat, they decimate the plant life before the pollinators harvest the flowers, before humans harvest the, the vegetables and fruits, before the plants can make seeds for the next generation. With their keen sense of smell, their grubby paws, their ability to grab and scourge, ravengers find the gardens and tear apart the plants, especially the newly sprouted. Gluttons, ravengers eat a bite of each fruit or vegetable, discard it and go on to the rest. Squirrel ravengers hoard plentiful pine seeds to feed their brood the following winter. Ravengers make sport out of most any task. Fun and games, the gray squirrel named Rocky is a beast that lives in the nearby gray pine trees. All pollinators fear this ravager. Not only does he pillage the fruits and vegetables, but he also hunts the eggs and young of the birds and animals that nest in his territory. For some unknown reason, he leaves the lizards alone. Andy keeps a watchful eye on Rocky. When Andy suspects that Rocky is stalking prey, he dive bombs the scoundrel, kamikaze style, using his long, thin beak like a dagger. Then the unspeakable horror happened. Was it a day or two later? Anna's nest with the chicks was nowhere to be found. And he cried out in horror and disbelief over and over, but Anna never answered. He darted here and there, frantically searching and pleading. Finally, he spotted the nest, torn apart, eggshells and feathers scattered on the ground. Andy blamed the ravager. After all, this is what ravager, ravagers do. He set off to find the beast and avenge the murder of his family. Then he saw Rocky running along a high pine branch. Andy took off like an arrow and nicked Rocky hard enough to knock him off the branch. Down, Rocky fell to a branch below. He couldn't hold on and plummeted to the ground. Startled and dazed, he caught his breath and scampered at full speed toward another tree. Andy caught up and nailed a squirrel leg with his rapier beak. Rocky skittered around the trunk out of sight and dug into the needles. He hid there and froze. Andy lost him, darting around the garden up and down the trees. He finally settled into the quince tree to wait, to wait until Rocky surfaced. Rocky knew that his injury would take time to heal. Meanwhile, Andy patrolled the garden, calling on the other birds, the finches, the robins, the quail, and even the jays to act as alarms. Finding Rocky took vigilance and patience. It wasn't long before the other birds would shout out the moment Rocky appeared. They knew what Andy's distress calls meant that terrible day. They had heard it before. Rocky pulled himself up into his nest in the tall gray pine, waiting until dark before sneaking out to find his hordes of pine seeds stored for the winter. Gradually his leg healed. He kept watch on the garden, wondering if Andy and the other animals would sleep long enough so he could feast on the now ripe apricots. The mission figs were too far away to check. Also, it was mating season, and he knew the primal feeling that would overpower him. And so it would go for the next few months. If Rocky left his nest during the day, the birds and animals sounded the alarm. Andy dive-bombed him, giving no quarter. Rocky was lightning quick as well, but began thinking about migrating to another garden. After a few months, he would travel as far away as he could see from his perch in the gray pine. Over the boundary fences, he would wander. That is, until he found another garden, more than a day's travel away with mandara plants in full bloom. It is in his travels beyond the boundary fences that Rocky finds the mentor who cha helped change his way of life. But that is a story for another time. Rocky had noticed how the hummers and other pollinators favored these flowers. Their complex blossoms are a vibrant 
iridescent red, with a hint of bergamot purple and a beautiful minty sweetness. Elixir from the heavens. Pollinators love this plant so much that they will fight over it and use it to curry favor from those they allow to sip its sublime sweetness. So Rocky the squirrel hatched a plan for a truce with Andy the Hummer. Andy and the other birds had not seen Rocky for many days. Rocky made his way back to the garden one night. He chewed off the blossoming mandara branches and hid them in the nearby mounds of pine needles. He returned to his exile to plan his next move. Soon he had it. He cleanly snapped off one of the giant mandara blossoms in that garden and ran at top speed back to where he knew Andy waited to wreak vengeance. Along the way, Rocky dipped the blossom into several ponds so that it could drink and stay fresh. Rocky jumped over the border fence of the garden just in time to see Andy still patrolling the Mundara patch. Rocky climbed up onto the backyard window box overlooking the garden. He clutched the Mundara blossom in his right armpit and paw while waving it in a figure eight pattern to catch Andy's attention. It caught the attention of all the birds at once and the cacophony of the alarm drew Andy to the window box. Andy could not believe what he saw. The source of his most profound grief and agony peeked from around the window box. He hovered for an instant ready to attack. Rocky chirped in his most sincere apologetic voice how sorry he felt for Andy's loss and displayed the largest Mondara blossom ever as a peace offering. The scent of the blossom mesmerized Andy. Never had he, had he seen a Mondara blossom so large and beautiful and filled with the nectar, nectar he prized above all. Andy hovered up and down, side to side, suspecting a trick from his nemesis. But Rocky held the blossom and faced Andy while chattering his amends without stopping. Rocky bowed his head and held the blossom steady. Andy took a sip. Rocky placed the blossom on the ledge and scampered back to his nest with the birds watching every move. A confused Andy looked at the Mandara blossom and gently licked a glowing fluted red petal. He looked at the pine tree, then the quince tree over and over. He quietly zipped up to a high branch in the quince to ponder his turn of this turn of events. As he perched overlooking his sacred garden, a memory appeared in his mind. It must have been from last year, it did not seem recent. He remembered a small gray squirrel frolicly, frolicking around the branches of the pine tree, chattering with glee at the fun of it. Beautiful and innocent, it must have been Rocky the Kit Squirrel before he learned how to pillage and murder. That memory changed Andy. Mercy replaced the dark thoughts polluting his mind. From that time on, he did not challenge what Rocky was doing, as long as Rocky kept his distance from the garden, the Mandara, and the other birds. And Rocky stopped foraging in Andy's garden and in the fruit trees. He hunted and foraged beyond the border fences. So that is the story of two avatars, Andy the Hummer, who overcomes oppression and a need for vengeance, and Rocky the Squirrel, who triumphs over a family history of pillaging and murder. The two go beyond settling for a truce, and this releases them from their ancestral struggles. They learn to live together in the garden paradise. The dark Mandara blossoms grow back, and there is enough food and water for all. A tenuous peace prevails. Maybe next year there will be a new generation of Hummer chicks and squirrel kits who will learn the new ways and teach their children in turn. As they've done since the beginning of time, the humans cultivated the gardens with love, kept the compost going, and provided enough water. Their songs honoring the earth, the sky, and the waters that, and the waters that give life all was right with the world. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Bill. Wow, that was so creative. So much fun, so interesting. And your artwork's beautiful. Um, I have seen it in person and it's amazing. And I want to direct the audience as well. We got a comment from Maggie Bosco, who um, she heads the Artifier window with you. Uh, she says, this is a beautiful mural and also a great story, Bill. I've seen it at the MASH, the Ma I think it's MASH gas station in Arinda. So if you all have a chance to go by MASH's gas station in Arinda, it is there on the window. Um, well, I just wonder when, when did it start? When did the story in your mind begin? Was it while you were painting the mural? Was it when you were sketching ideas for the mural? How did this- When I was sketching the ideas, uh, the story began to come together. First, of course, there were the characters involved. I knew I wanted to put a hummingbird and a squirrel in it just because they're so present in my garden. And oh. this, this is where the story took place in my garden. Well, mm -hmm. I should say our garden. Elena uses it too. <laughs> and Elena's. Uh, and your ballad shows a keen observation of what goes on between the critters in your garden. Um, did the story evolve from that, those interactions, from watching those interactions then? It definitely did. Okay. Of course, the, the garden has been going here for nine years. So over that time, I've observed many interactions and behaviors of the various animals, plants, and insects mm -hmm. that inhabit it. And so I, I was able to put all of those things together into the story. Right. Do you go through a lot of drafts before you're satisfied with your final piece? your written piece? Not so much the painting part, but the writing part, it's, it's tiresome how many revisions I make. Okay, that's good information for other writers out there. So it's a constant read. But I, I think absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. All yeah. the visual arts in, incorporate an initial idea and then the idea gets expanded and then pulled apart and then put back together. Interesting. And would you recommend then using one or more editors for writing or um, for writing a blog or a, or a story like, um, you know, a longer story? Yeah, I definitely recommend as many editors as can stand it. Really? Lots of different viewpoints. I, for this story, I use four editors. Wow, okay, good to know. We have some comments um, on our Q&A. Great. Uh, besides Maggie's, we have Lori Chung. She says, thanks, Bill, love your art. How does your art, art com comment on current events in the world? How does your art comment on current events in the world? Hmm. Okay. Well, that's the, the nature of a story like this. It's, it's meant to uh, take in the, the kinds of behavior that humans engage in and present it in a, in a form that is an allegory. So yes, a lot of what's gone on in human history with conflict and with uh, the redemption that is necessary for life to go on this memorializes that and allows people to take it away from human element and then bring it back into what goes on in our daily lives. Right, right. Um, Susan Garrell says, enjoyed both your storytelling in color and your colorful storytelling, Bill. Thanks. And Jeffrey Rosnick says, great story, Bill. And Jim Gunchanen, who we had on the show before, he says, Bill, you have a way with words, wonderful. And one more comment, Arlene Reed, really love the story and the beautiful paintings. I really appreciate how the story concludes as it relates to human behavior today. <laughs> Let's hope. 
<laughs> that's, I hope that's how it is. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here again, you can read Bill Carmel's blogs. They're wonderful as he's always blogging about current art exhibits, things going on um, in the art world today on Danville San Ramon, Danville San Ramon.com forward slash blogs. Is that correct, Bill? That's right. And the blog itself. Yeah, Dan Danville San Ramon. Okay. So go ahead and check him out there. Thank you again, Bill. Thank you. All right. And next. Yeah, okay. And next up, we have artist Mary Lou Correa's inspiration. Um, well, Mary Lou Correa. And I hope I'm not butchering your name, Mary Lou. So let's fingers crossed there. Mary Lou's uh, inspiration for painting arises from observing nature and man's gentle intrusion into it. The angular slope of an old barn, reflections in a quiet stream, the changing of light, of a pastoral scene. Influenced by the Impressionist's use of brilliant, sensuous layers of color, she paints loosely with exuberant brushstrokes and her vibrant color combinations express the changing moods of the landscapes. Challenged by painting pure landscape with only the hint of human presence, her painting encourages the viewer to appreciate and preserve landscape for future generations. Mary Lou's works are in the collections, in collections throughout the world and galleries in San Francisco, the East Bay and Marin County who represent her. She teaches plein air workshops on a regular basis through the Walnut Creek Civic Arts Education Program. Welcome Mary Lou to our show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Denise. What a pleasure. Great. How wonderful that we're, we're um, doing this online with all these wonderful creative people and um, using this new media to teach everyone and communicate, it's so important. It's one of the silver linings, I think, coming out of the pandemic. Um, yeah, absolutely, I think you're right. I'm hoping that we will be able to do both in-person and Zoom Art Embraces Words in the future so that you know people from out of state or everywhere can participate in our program. Yeah, so it is. Do you wanna, elaborate a little bit about your art and your background and maybe show us what you brought for us to see today. Yes, I sure do. Um, I paint for the joy of it. Uh, I started as a kid when I was about 12 years old taking lessons in classical painting uh, in Ridgewood Art Association in New Jersey. Um, I was just fortunate that my parents recognized my passion and um, appreciated and encouraged me. So went on through college, taught, um, taught art and English in Monterey, <laughs> Salinas area. Um, took a hiatus for a while as I raised my son and really never left it, but went back into it with photography um, while I was teaching and working full time. And then uh, suddenly started plein air painting Enjoying the, the rich vistas that we have in California, we are so fortunate to have the weather and the, uh, so many artists pre pre uh, preceding us in uh, the passion for plein air painting. I, I just really love it on site much more than in the studio. My studio, um, I go ahead and finish some of the paintings, especially commissions or really large pieces. And I set up a um, video screen and uh, enlarge my photographs to, to recreate the feeling of painting outside. I'm sensitive to the seasons. And um, right now we're full of the joy of color of spring. This one is called Soaring. And it's, um, for me, it means the adventure of painting. I was down with a um, Monterey group that I belong to since I um, taught in Salinas, lived in Pacific Grove for a while, I really relate to that area and I love the ocean. The water is very soothing to me. So um, Monterey Group was painting in Point Lobos and I, I went down during pandemic, um, I think it was last March, beginning of March, and um, found myself a spot at the end, at the end of the park 
um, by China Camp, if anyone's familiar with um, Point Lobos. And um, what I like to do is, is sit for a while and get a sense of the place and the ocean and the feeling of it. Uh, this is 11 by 14, it's small. And I just was very uh, appreciative of the birds. I, all during the pandemic, I've really felt close to, to birds and the freedom they have, you know, which is something that we haven't had as much of during the pandemic. So um, it's called soaring. And I was really attentive to not over, over um, detailing the birds, but have the, just the feeling of them soaring and the feeling of the ocean. So that's what painting is to me. It's beautiful. It's, I love how the light is. Um, <laughs> anyway, the- Sorry, I interrupted. Just no. saying, I love how the light on the, on the rocks. Right. Um, that's the thing about plein air painting. You, um, you are attracted to the light. I'm attracted to the season and the adventure that I find um, in painting. The, the adventure for me was the birds. You know, I, I was intent on the rock and the ocean and um, mindful of the birds soaring. And so that's where the, the name of it came from. Um, so also um, attending to the surprise that I come across in nature, I talk about uh, critters coming into the painting. I, <laughs> I have a whole series on my website of critters because uh, I, I love to interpret animals and birds. And so I've done all these smaller paintings of critters. But anyway, um, so that was last March. And this is typical of plein air painting. It's a smaller size. I like to complete as much as I can of the painting on site, uh, put, complete the whole canvas, um, turn it around, look at it in a mirror, turning, turning myself around for um, composition, et cetera, to see how it works and then take it home and let it wear on my wall for a while to see how it feels. Uh, this one felt good, so I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, we might That's try the next. Your next. the next one. Okay, um, during the pandemic, um, I found myself almost like going oh, hold on. On, there it is. on Golden Pond. I, I found myself uh, walking and being out with friends. I live in Mar Martinez on the edge of Pleasant Hill. And so I could ride my bike down to the marina and uh, walk the marina with friends a lot. And one of the things that really struck me besides the marvelous variety of birds there is how especially dads were enjoying their kids um, just playing in the marshes, in the, um, along the paths. And this one struck me, this is from a photograph. Um, I call it Go Daddy. Uh, because I just, I, maybe it's because I have a son and grandchildren, but my son is an especially wonderful dad. And so I was really relating to the dad and, and um, how he was playing with his child. Um, and part of what I was hoping is that as the silver lining of this pandemic, that this continues this um, new learned cherishing of family, um, at least from the onset, from the onlooker, it, it's, um, it's very intimate and enjoyable to watch. So that's what I was portraying in this one. It's from a um, series of photographs. I, I really enjoy my camera as well. So I spend a lot of time close to home. Um, painting the mountain again. And I have a group of painters, it's called Friday Painters, um, out of my classes that have continued all through the pandemic. And um, we kind of coordinate where we're gonna paint. And it's been a wonderful social release and meditative healing thing during this time for all of us. 
in <laughs> painting the Lafayette Reservoir, we had the real fun experience of being videotaped by CNN. I didn't know that that's what they were doing, but you know, we space ourselves with our masks on um, six feet apart, and then we get together for lunch. We've done this all during the pandemic. It's a variety of people. Um, a lot of them have been my students, but um, people enjoying it as a hobby, people who are more uh, professional and just enjoying the outside. And it's, it's kind of been a savior for us, I think, during the pandemic. So our wonderful videotaper from CNN um, photographed us and then came again to Benicia where um, our cooperative gallery is, the Benicia Planer Gallery and photographed us all painting. So um, I'm gonna put that one on my, on my website. We have it on the Benicia Planer Gallery website if anybody cares to see it. Um, and enjoyable experience and we keep it up. We keep going every Friday. Um, if people wanna join me, I'm, I'm very happy to do that. We help informal kind of critiques Mm -hmm. out yeah. of my question. Okay, okay so um, we might try the next one. That's GoDaddy. This is called Unenjoy. I, um, well, we used to attend uh, the Shakespearean Festival in Ashwood, Oregon, all the time. Um, it's actually a church group and a whole group of friends, about 60 people. And so that's in March. So the last March um, was, I don't know if you remember it, but there were tremendous rainstorms on the way back. You know, um, my friend was driving, a couple of us drive together and I was photographing and it was just the time when the almonds out in, um, towards Vallejo, beyond that on 505, Highway 505, are all blooming and um, it just, blooming trees bring a sense of joy to me. And um, so I photographed it, photographed in my mind's eye several paintings on the way down and back home. And then I knew when the almonds were blooming, I knew it's a very short season. And this is what I do, I follow the season. So I returned by myself to trying five, it's actually exit 12 when 505, <laughs> because I marked it in my camera. And so I returned and um, it actually was, I, I can't, a previous work done canvas that I'd scraped down, retreated, and it was much bigger than I really wanted it to be. It's um, 18 by 24, but that's what I had. So I set myself up in a um, washed out road and I remember it well because I was on top of a wasp hive, <laughs> which, is, which is part of the um, adventure of painting outside. One has to be careful where they are. And well, it's absolutely stunning. Well, thank you. Um, so I just totally enjoyed this painting. And that's what this is for me. It's the joy of painting. It's my entertainment, my passion. And I love to share mm -hmm. it with others. I love to share it with people who take them into their homes. Sometimes I'm just amazed that people do that. Um, yeah. you know, well, it's, it's absolutely stunning. And we are, we are so thrilled that we had you on today and uh, to see your beautiful, beautiful work. And I imagine people can look for you at the Walnut Creek Civic Arts um, Education Program, are you still doing classes there or you took a hiatus? Well, um, they didn't want to do anything this spring because of COVID, um, but we still go out. That's what I'm saying. This is a continuation. And um, yes, I'll do, I'll do it again in the fall, I hope. <laughs> Dep depending on what Civic Arts was. Yeah, we have a comment from um, Jim Gunshinen, uh, who said, I can almost hear the surf in your painting. So he definitely felt when, something when he was looking at that and it was beautiful. Um, I just also wanna remind if anybody else has any other questions to let us know. So quickly, um, how 
do you divide your time between plein air exhibiting and teaching? Or let's talk about prior to pandemic, I guess, because it's a little bit, it's been a little weird, I guess, the last year. Yeah, it really has. Mm -hmm. um, I do the teaching. It's, it's not really a job. I do it for the pleasure of it. As I said, I enjoy the company of other artists. I say to my students, I learn as much from you as, as I can teach you. And mm -hmm. um, I, I just enjoy the company of other artists. I also enjoy, enjoy my private time of recreating or um, as in the, the um, GoDaddy painting. I, I did that in, in privacy and um, it's very absorbing. Um, Showing is, it's been hard, as you know, there's been a lot of virtual shows, which are, it's great that people are doing that. I, I enjoy a couple of little galleries in the city. A lot have closed. Um, and the Benicia Plain Air Gallery, um, we kept open the whole time. We, we still are open and I enjoy it. It's, it's a way of having good company. Right. Well, thank you so much for being here again, Mary Lou. And you can see more of Mary Lou's work, which by the way, what you saw today is for sale. Um, but you can also see more of her work at, um, it's M L Correa. So Mary Lou, the M, the L Correa.com. So you can look for her online and see more of her work. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank and, you. And it was wonderful. So now I would like to introduce you to our final author today. His name is Michael Barrington. And uh, Michael originally comes to us from England, but is currently living in the East Bay. He has led a very interesting life. He spent 10 years with, the French, with a French order of missionary priests in West Africa. Several of those years during a civil war when he was stood up to be shot. So... I have to hear more about that. He lived for a year as a hermit in North Ireland. He taught in Madrid, Spain, and in Puerto Rico. And he's currently a member of the Rotary International, and he flies all over the world, monitoring and evaluating humanitarian projects. He has worked in more than 30 countries and is fluent in several languages. He holds three master's degrees and a PhD. Now, Michael has always been a writer, mainly of spiritual inspirational essays, some of which he is currently preparing for publication for later this year. His first work, The Bishop Wears No Drawers, is a memoir of 10 years spent in Africa, some of it during the Civil War. Today, Michael will read from his most recent work, Let the Peacock Sing, which is a historical novel set against the backdrop of the French resistance during World War II. Michael, it's a pleasure to have you on our show today. Uh, happy, happy to be here. Okay, and we are very excited to hear you read from your excerpt. Sure, uh, I make an apology before I read it. Um, the subtitle to my book is uh, Love in a Time of Resistance, um, but I'm not gonna read about love today. Um, I, th I thought about it and thought about it. There are three love stories that run right through the book. And if I try to talk about them, I think I would spoil it for any readers. Okay. So, so I will address it kind of differently. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk about that later. Okay, very good. So the background to the book itself, to this, to this reading, is that 10 years before World War II, a very rich and staunchly Catholic countess called Henriette, she donated several hundred acres of land so that a monastery could be built next to her chateau. And she became the head of several underground resistance groups and invited the local abbot of the monastery, Père Louis, to be part of her team. Uh, later, she was betrayed by one of her members, Henry, who was a local butcher. And the shadow had been, the shadow had been raided by the Gestapo the previous week, but nothing cr incriminating was found. And now the SS and Gestapo, with new information from Henry, are set to raid the monastery and capture Père Louis, also known as the Bull. However, the chief of police, a member of Henriette's, the Countess's group, was able to tip off the abbot concerning the early morning raid. 
so the monks knew that it was coming. Before the monks retired for the night, Père Louis called into his office all of those who were playing a role in helping the resistance groups and discussed with them how they could hide any trace of work for the allies. There were now eight of them. Three young monks who worked primarily on the farm were excited about the support and opportunity they could give to Père Louis and proposed uh, their own plan just to make it difficult for any vehicle to reach the monastery. Breaking all of the rules of silence, they were huddled together, chatting quietly. Per, one said, we have a suggestion. Yes, what is it, brother? We think that if we open the sluice gates on our lake, it will flood the meadow and wash out the road to the monastery. If nothing else, it will slow down the Gestapo advance and give us even more time to prepare for their visit. Good idea, replied Père Louis with a smile. Then you must take care of it. There is a full moon tonight. Why not start now? Thank you, Père, they responded. We will be done before our morning prayers. And what about the print shop, Brother Pascal? What are your plans? Père, we've already decided that with your permission, we will move everything temporarily to the chateau. The Gestapo will surely not go there again. It will take us just a couple of hours, and I have three brothers who will help me. And you, Anselm, will you be able to conceal of your forgery equipment? Yes, Père, he replied, and I too would like to move it to the chateau. I'm sure Madame the Countess Henriette will oblige us. Yes, I'm sure it will be fine, he replied, but let me call her now. It's not too late for her. Minutes later, it was all arranged. I have one issue for myself, brothers. The Gestapo will be looking for me, for Père Louis, and I too have a suggestion. I will ask our recently deceased brother Alphonse to look over us and help us through this crisis. I know he will not mind if I make use of, I make use of his name. God bless us all, and now let's get some sleep before our guests arrive. Seeing the road suddenly submerged by what appeared to be a huge lake caused the convoy to stop and an irritable discussion took place with the SS officer and the Gestapo. He decided that one truck should try to cross first. Once all of the soldiers stepped down, the driver inched forward and slowly entered the lake. About halfway over in about three feet of water, with its wheels spinning, it settled in the mud. The driver stood on the running board, shouting to the officer that he could move neither forward nor backward. Fortunately, the second truck had a winch on the front and the driver took off his boots, waded out and tied a cable to its rear hitch, then returned and slowly pulled the truck back to dry land. All of this wasted two hours. And since the monastery was in plain view, if there was to be any element of surprise, it was long gone. The issue for the group was how to proceed. After another hotly debated discussion, the officer in charge removed his boots and rolling up his pants, waded into the thigh deep water, followed by the soldiers and Gestapo. As they regrouped, they were not only wet and mud covered, but had lost much of their initial excitement, enthusiasm, and German assuredness at being able to capture the bull and his clandestine operation. Banging repeatedly on the front door, it was finally opened and brother Roger, the guest master stood there looking at the bedraggled group and asked innocently how he could help them. We are here to arrest Père Louis and to make sure that there are no activities against the right taking place. My men will search every room. And waving his hand, signaled for them to spread out and begin. Stop, shouted Brother Roger. This is a house of God. Are you all heathens? Are you all pagans? Take off your dirty boots and leave them here. There is no need to break down any doors. Wait just one minute and I'll have several escorts for you who will take you 
wherever you wish to go. Shocked at first by the monk's effrontery, the officer finally nodded in agreement. After vanishing through a cloister door for a few seconds, Brother Roger returned with four monks who led the soldiers after removing their boots, but still dripping wet over the stone floors into the cloister and the workshops. While this was taking place, Père Louis entered the lobby with two other monks with shaved heads dressed identically in their monks robes and all almost the same height and build, it was difficult to differentiate who was who just by looking at them. How can I help you, officer greeted Perlui and disdainfully eyeing the Gestapo up and down, asked, who are these other gentlemen? They must be here on important business since they trouble themselves like you with crossing the lake. They are looking for Père Louis. He is believed to be a leader of a local resistance group and the head of your monastery. That's just not possible, he replied. He could never do such a thing. Our monks are bound to stay inside the cloister and only go out to work on the farm. There is much false information being spread these days. I would suggest that you verify your sources. That's for us to decide, the officer said dismissively. Let's not waste any more time here. Take us to Père Louis. Then please follow us, he said softly. And you will forgive us, officer, but we would like to pray as we go along. The officer, the Gestapo and two soldiers put their waterlogged boots back on and with the monks leading, went out of the front door and walked along the side of the chapel until they reached the cemetery. It was its own separate area of about a quarter acre, surrounded by a white picket fence. Entering inside, Pelouis stopped before a grave that had been newly filled in. There was a simple white wooden cross as a marker. Here is Pelouis, he said sadly. We buried him two weeks ago. He had been sick for some time. Then who are you, the officer asked in frustration. What is your name? Oh, I'm only the acting abbot. The community has yet to decide who the next leader will be. My name is Brother Alphonse. Would you like to see my identity card? No, that will not be necessarily, he snapped back angrily. But we must now meet with my soldiers and see what they have discovered. Once assembled in the lobby, Brother Roger invited everybody into the dining room for a drink of cold water. Well, what did you find? Barked out the officer. Is there anything here that shows action against the Reich? Nobody moved or said anything. Then we're wasting our time here. Let's return to breathe. And after pulling on their boots, they exited the monastery and prepared to slog through the mud and water again. Unhappy with the raid, and especially so since the officer in charge had announced to his superiors that he was about to arrest the bull who had evaded them for so long, he immediately called for Henry. This time the interrogation was short and to the point. He had again provided inaccurate information to the SS and the Gestapo. And they had not only wasted time, it had been both a shameful and embarrassing operation. Showing up in wet and filthy uniforms, having to step out of their boots and execute a search barefooted was both humiliating and belittling. But above all, there was not a single shred of evidence that Père Louis was active. In fact, he had been, de he had been dead for some time, nor that the monastery was engaged in any clandestine work. The military court quickly established that Henry had provided misleading information to the Reich on two occasions, that he himself was engaged in illegal black market activity and had already confessed to being the leader of a resistance cell. Needing to show retaliation for the disaster, loss of soldiers at La Prodel 
and to get maximum publicity, <coughs> the German authorities planned on having several public executions on the, on the next market day. Together with three members of another group that had recently been uncovered, they were marched from their jail cells around the marketplace, taken to the courtyard behind the administration building where people would be able to hear the shots and they were executed. A reading uh, about yes, no. <laughs> atrocities. Go ahead. A reading about atrocities, but maybe redemption. Well, mm, atrocities, yes. Um, thank you so much. I just want to remind the audience if anyone has a question for Michael to please type it in the Q&A box below. That was fascinating. Um, I, I know that your first book, The Bishop Wears No Drawers, was a memoir. Um, how did you decide to write a book on the French resistance during World War II? And were you possibly inspired by your experiences while you were living in France? Mm, yes, yes, and yes. Um, if you look behind me, I've, already, I've always been a history buff. And if you look behind me to my bookcases, uh, all of those bookcases are just about World War II and half of them are in French. So I've been fascinated by it for years and years. Uh, <clears throat> and it just came to me one day, I was thinking of an idea and I, I wanted to write about the resistance and uh, talk about mm -hmm. creative writing. I started writing and I couldn't put stop writing. I just, I finished it in about three months. Yeah. Um, wow, very quickly. Yeah. Interesting. And uh, a question from Elena Olaski. How are love and redemption different in the midst of World War II as opposed to peaceful civilian life in yeah. France? It's a great question. And the reason why I didn't talk about, um, I'll select a, a piece about love. Um, there, are, there are three main love stories going through the book. Um, Henriette herself, the Countess, um, she was madly in love with a man. She's a widow. She was only married for four years. She was crazy about this man. They were only married for four years. She never remarried. Père Louis was engaged to be married and stopped it and became a monk. Mm -hmm. And so you've got these two characters playing off each other. I'm not going to tell you too much about it, but right throughout the book, there is a relationship there. And then... Uh, an, another love story is a, an agent, a female agent, is, is parachuted in to help these groups. A young woman in her 30s who is a radio operator, she's trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat. She can kill, she's a, at the drop of a hat. And so presents as a, a pretty tough character. And throughout the book, you see that change. It softens and it's the whole relationship that she gets into that changes her character. And the third one is uh, a young uh, resistance fighter who falls in love with a German, young German woman who's in the German administration. And that has its own complications. Mm. But th because it, it's wartime, there is betrayal, neighbor turning in neighbor. There are terrible atrocities. The only redemption in the book is through these love stories. And they're all subtle and different. That they they really show you the another side of human nature, um, and the values are, are love and respect respect for individuals for the person. It's yes. surrounded with all this other stuff, the, the 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 horrors of war, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm certainly intrigued now to go get your book and read it. Sounds wonderful. Um, and why did you include an epilogue? This is asked by Elena as well. Why did you include an epilogue in the um, Let the Peacock Sing book? I get asked that all the time in, when I'm doing presentations. It, it's, it's a writing technique. How's uh, that? I took, I took the main characters and uh, I wanted people to know what happened to them after the war. And so I, I wrote just a, a small, small couple of paragraphs on each one. And it's fascinating. I've got so buried in my blog and, and everybody believes that these characters are real and they're not real. The, the main characters are 
from my imagination, but there are a lot of other characters who are real. I see. I keep, I keep getting these emails say, as if they're real, real people, all of them. And it's kind of a, I have to write back saying, no, it's a. Is the monastery out. real and the chateau real? The chateau is a real place. Mm -hmm. That is a real place. The Countess, figment of my imagination. She's a composite, she's a composite of several women that I knew. Okay. And the abbot, I lived in a Trappist monastery for a year, and he is the French version of an Irishman that I knew. I see, I see. Well, all extremely fascinating. Um, and I know that you have uh, some coming in. You said that you were writing, um, in your intro, you were writing some essays and you're putting them together into a publication? Yeah. I've just finished uh, another novel. I okay. finished another novel, which will be published in the next couple of months. Right. Okay, good. Oh, we had a comment. Um, in the world of imagination, your characters are real. So I'm sure that everyone will believe so when they read your book. Fabulous. All right, Michael. Well, <laughs> good. Thank you so much for being with us. And I want to let you know that all you have to do is uh, look up Michael Barrington on amazon.com and you can see his books there and purchase them. Um, thank you again. We really enjoyed listening to your You're very welcome today. Thank you. Well, we hope everyone enjoyed our event today. I'm sure that you'll agree that bringing the written word and the visual artistry together is a magical thing. And if you'd like more information on any of our writers and artists, please do reach out to us at lamarindaarts.org. The La Miranda Arts Council is a nonprofit organization and we rely on the support of our community to make these worthwhile programs um, please do consider making a donation to La Mirinda Arts Council. Uh, you can find that uh, location to donate at lamirindaarts.org forward slash donate. Here you go. You can see it here. So I want to thank once again the authors and the artists for being here today and thank everyone watching the La Mirinda Arts Council's Art Embraces Words. We'll see you next time.